Hey guys and welcome to another episode. That day is finally here. We're going to be taking apart the mini motor and figuring out why the hell my engine is not really working that well. So I tried doing a sandblasting kind of thing in my cylinder head to remove any carbon that was built up in the cylinder head. I thought that was going to solve my problem, but it hasn't. I thought the engine was going to run perfectly, but it still has a misfire in cylinder four. So I read up and I did a lot of research on this motor and these things are notorious for this issue. So what I decided to do and what I'm going to be doing today and getting started with everything that you see up top here is pretty much going to be removed I got to take off the entire intake side and I want to pull the head so I can see where my issue is whether it be the valve whether it be my timing chain whether it be it the timing chain maybe skipped a tooth on one of the cam or exhaust um, sprockets or whatever it be today we're gonna be taking apart the mini motor and we're gonna figure out what the hell is the issue with this thing we're going to begin by first removing the battery, so we need to disconnect the positive and the negative terminals of it so we don't have any kind of power supplied to any kind of electrical part in the vehicle. Next up, we're going to get the car raised up in the air. So I'm going to have the front suspended by jacks, and the rear I'm going to have it up on a set of ramps because we don't really need to access anything in the rear. On the front, however, we're going to need to have it supported by a set of jack stands because we're going to need to remove the front passenger side wheel to get access to some engine components found inside the wheel well. With that now done and out of the way, it's time to remove the intake from the car. So what I'm going to do first is remove a PCV valve that's attached to the valve cover. Once we remove that and get that out of the way, there's one screw that's attached underneath that's securing the bottom part of the cold air intake in place. Once we have that out, we can move to the other side of the intake where we're going to need to remove one clip that's attached to the mass airflow sensor. Once we remove that, there's going to be two other bands that are connecting the pipe for the cold air intake up to the pipe that connects to the turbocharger. Once we have those out we can actually lift up the entire cold air intake system and remove it from the car. After that there's going to be one more PCV pipe that's connected up to the valve cover that leads to the pipe for the turbocharger. There's going to be one electrical connector that we're going to have to remove along with another clamp found at the turbocharger. There's then going to be one little piece of plastic that's clipping in and securing the PCV pipe up to the valve cover. With that removed we can take the entire pipe that's connected up to the turbocharger out of the way. Don't forget to put that little plastic piece back so that once we go to reinstall this down the road, it's going to be very easy because we haven't lost anything. Next up comes disassembling the ignition system. So what we're going to be taking apart next is we're going to be removing each one of the coil packs along with the spark plugs that are attached to each one. So in each one of the cylinders, we're going to have one coil pack and one spark plug. The first thing we're going to need to do is disconnect the connector for the coil pack, lift it straight up and out. And then afterwards, you're going to need to get a spark plug socket for your appropriate spark plug. In this case, mine's a 12 point and just crack each one of these spark plugs loose and remove the entire thing. You're going to want to repeat this step for each one of your spark plugs and your coil packs that you have for your car. So since my car is a four cylinder, I'll be doing this four times in total. If you have a V8, for example, you'll be doing this eight times. Once you have each one of them set aside, make sure that you label and coordinate as to which one goes where. So I labeled and kept together each spark plug and coil pack and labeled it as to which cylinder I removed it from. To remove the cylinder head from the actual engine, we need to disconnect everything that's connected to the intake and exhaust side of the head. So right here we're going to be removing everything from the intake side. So we have the intake manifold along with this pipe right here. The pipe that we're going to be removing is called a noise maker and this pipe comes off of the intercooler piping. When I go ahead to reinstall all of this stuff after we fix the engine problems, I'm not going to be installing this piece because there's a delete kit for it. So it's this pipe is not necessary but it is necessary to remove by removing the little hose clamp that's found to the left and then push the entire pipe down. After that's done we can take it out and then move on to the other intercooler piping. So the intercooler piping that you see right here is the same kind of deal. It's connected from a hard pipe and goes to a silicone bend. It's held in place by a hose clamp, unscrew it, push it out of the way and then we can get working on the actual intake manifold. So there's going to be five nuts that we need to remove one on each one of the spots that I'm pointing to and you're going to have to take each one of these out with a ratchet and your socket. Now you might need an extension depending on the length of it and once you have each one of these five out the intake manifold you will be able to remove from the studs on the intake side of the cylinder head. So there's going to be five nuts attached to each one of the five studs holding it on. So once you slide the intake manifold off, there's going to be a couple electrical connectors and components found underneath the manifold that we're also going to have to slide off and remove to remove it from the car. 
With the manifold off, underneath we're going to have a couple mechanical actuators that are going to be modulating the vacuum, and that's for the blow-off valve and for the wastegate. They're both attached up to the intake manifold, and they're basically installed by two little arms that stick out. So once you remove both of those and slide them off, we can lift it up a little bit more, and we can see that we still have one connector on the left of it, and that is all the wiring that's necessary for the throttle plate. So the entire throttle body mechanism is all right there, and that one connector needs to be disconnected so we can remove it from the vehicle. I forgot to mention there's one little port on the back side of the intake manifold that runs off a vacuum. You just literally pinch it out and you'll be able to remove it. It's the same kind of vacuum line that we had that attached to the top of the valve cover that leads to the intake manifold. That's the last kind of thing that's attached to the intake and we'll be able to take the entire thing out finally. If you guys plan on going through with this procedure, if you guys have a Mini Cooper, I want to make it so that this is the ultimate guide. So right here, these are the five spots that the studs ran through the manifold that connected up to the head. Afterwards on the sides right here, these are where the uh, the vacuum mechanisms were attached to on the back side of the intake. This is your entire throttle body, the plate, and if we turn it over, you can see all the tubing that we had for the intercooler piping. And that is actually what we removed and that what was called the noise maker. With the components for the intake now removed, it's time to move on to the exhaust side. So I'm first going to start off by removing the O2 sensor using this special O2 sensor socket. So it slides right over top of the wire and we can get access to the O2 sensor and crack it loose. So once you have it slightly loose, you'd want to remove the wire from the actual cylinder head, disconnect it from the connector, and then at that point we can remove the entire sensor from the exhaust manifold. Next up, we're going to start removing the heat shielding for the exhaust downpipe. We're going to be removing most of the exhaust system, so this heat shield needs to be removed so we can get the downpipe removed as well. There are about six bolts on the top that are holding the heat shield in place, along with another six found underneath the car. Once you remove each one of the little bolts that are attaching the heat shield onto the manifold, you'll be able to slide the heat shield right off of the entire exhaust side of the car. So once you have it out, you'll be able to see the exhaust manifold, the downpipe, and the turbocharger. The downpipe is held in place by three nuts that are attached to three studs on the turbocharger. So to loosen everything up, you're just going to be grabbing an extension with a 13 millimeter socket and you're going to be loosening up each one of the nuts on the studs. So that's just going to be found on top once that's cracked loose, we're going to go down, go underneath the vehicle, so we can actually disconnect the V-band clamp that's attached to the bottom part of the downpipe. I'm going to be using a 16 millimeter deep socket to remove that, and we're going to have to take that off so we can disconnect the downpipe from the rest of the catback exhaust. So it's just held in place, you're going to be basically just pushing it down and out of the way. And the V-band might be a little bit tough, but you should be able to get access to it um, fairly easily. What I find easiest to do is push either the V-band forwards or backwards over top of the little hump. And if you really need the extra help, you can grab a little hammer and give it a couple taps and it should move out of the way. Once you have it moved, you can actually slide the catback part out and the downpipe will be disconnected from the catback. The next thing that I want to do is remove the entire catback exhaust from the car. So you can see that it's held in place and suspended by these metal hangers. We're going to have a couple of them up front and a couple of them on the back of the car. Now what I'm going to do to make these things a little bit easier is spray a little bit of penetrating fluid, uh, in particular some PB blaster, through the actual metal hanger and the rubber part. So you're going to be spraying a little bit inside of there, especially if these exhaust hangers are a little rusty and it's going to help it so that the metal part is going to slide right out from the rubber part. You're going to do this to each one of the rubber hangers that you have on there, all in the beginning. You're going to let it sit for about a minute or two, and then when you come in here to remove each one of the hangers from the rubber part using your exhaust hanger pliers, it's going to be very easy. The pliers are just going to want to push the hanger right out from the center of the rubber part, and it's going to be a breeze. When you remove each one of the hangers, the entire exhaust is going to want to drop. So I'm going to be using my jack and a piece of wood underneath of it to suspend it and hold it up in the air. So in the back of the car, it's not really being held in place by anything in the exhaust system other than the jack. Next up right now, as you can see, I'm just going to be taking out the front exhaust hangers that are suspending it. And then once I have that entirely off, the exhaust will be off of the vehicle. So the front will be able to drop, the back will also be able to drop, but I've got them both supported. I have a little trolley creeper that I'm going to be putting underneath the exhaust so I can literally pull the entire thing straight out. Now if you have an extra person to help you out with this, it will be a lot easier. Now I know for a fact that there are going to be guys commenting about my exhaust saying, oh why is it rusting already? Now it is stainless steel, but some of the stuff that was used to weld this stuff um, was steel, and that's how you basically weld. 
it wasn't painted, it wasn't coated, and the exhaust system isn't even that old. Now, it is bothering me, and that's why I'm going to be taking care of this right now. This isn't exactly a procedure for the engine procedure. You don't need to paint up your exhaust, but what I'm going to be doing today is cleaning this up, removing the rust on it, and actually making it so that it's not going to rust out anymore. All these welds and everything, they're all mechanically good, they're all structurally fine, but they are bothering me. So I'm going to clean this up, get rid of the rust, and have it so it's not going to come back. I'm going to first begin by cleaning up any of the rust that we have. I've got a little piece of scotch bright that I'm going to be rubbing over any of the rusted areas of the exhaust. I'm going to focus my aim to that, um, but I am 100% going to cover everything and just basically scratch everything up on the entire exhaust. So all the piping, all the welds, all the joints, all the, uh, all the hangers, everything is going to be basically rubbed down and removed of any surface rust. After that, it's going to be a matter of just priming it and getting it ready for paint. So I'm going to be cleaning up all the welds, all the joints, everything that you see on the exhaust system. That little extra time that you spend beforehand will make your painting procedure last a lot longer. So if you need to, use a little bit of brake clean to clean something up, use some sandpaper, use a wire wheel, whatever you want to use. Next up, I'm just going to be masking up the exhaust tips. I don't want to paint those up and I want to keep them looking nice and shiny. So I'm just going to be using a little bit of 3M tape to cover it up. It takes about two seconds and it's going to be saving you later so you don't have to clean up any overspray that lands on the tips. After that, just use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on a rag and wipe down the entire exhaust, all the joints, and everything. Next up, you're going to be grabbing some high heat primer, stuff that will actually work for an exhaust system. This stuff is meant for metal and it's resistant for up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Since the exhaust isn't necessarily going to get that hot, this is perfect. So you can be spraying a little light coat over everything and realistically you want to focus your aim towards any of the spots that were rusty beforehand. So any of the welds that we had before, you want to clean those up and paint a lot in there. If you can, put a little bit of paint on there a little bit excessively so you have even a little bit of runs on each one of the welds. Once you have the entire thing primed up, we're going to let this sit for about 10-15 minutes, flip it over and then we're going to try and get the areas that we couldn't get from the first shot. Once your first coat is dried, you're going to let that sit for another 10 minutes, and then you're going to go over this with a second coat. Next up, we're going to be using high heat paint. Now, the paint that I'm going to be using today is actually for barbecues, and it works very well for exhaust work too. So this stuff is rated for 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not going to burn off, and it's actually going to last a long time. So you're going to be using this in the exact same kind of manner as before. You're going to apply a light coat over the entire thing because you do have the primer as the base. So the primer that we sprayed before is what's going to make it so the rust isn't going to want to come through. This black paint is just to make it look pretty and make it look nice. So just get a little bit of paint. You're going to do two coats on this just like we did before. Nothing too heavy. You're not looking for runs. And once you're done, you're going to have great results. Once you're done with the first coat on the first side, you're going to flip it over and do the exact same thing for the second side. And once it's done, you can see how killer this looks. It gives a nice flat black finish to it. Everything looks good. We do have a little bit of spatter from the welding, but there's not really much you can do about that other than grinding it off. I'm not that particular with it because this exhaust didn't really cost me that much, and I'm going to be doing some different exhaust work come next summer once I have the new turbo and my new motor rebuilt. So if we go back into the garage and start working on the car again, we have to remove the downpipe and the heat shield next. Before we can actually remove both of them, we need to disconnect the secondary O2 sensor up to the downpipe. So we're going to be using the exact same kind of tool that we used before when we removed the primary O2 sensor. We're going to need to disconnect the sensor so it's not going to be connected to anything, unscrew it, and then we can start removing the other bolts for the downpipe. There's going to be a couple of them that actually support the downpipe up to the block and keep it in place. So if you remember from before, we had the top three nuts uh, from the turbocharger to the downpipe loose, and you can see there's a little bit of give. You're going to want to go ahead now and fully remove them so we can actually disconnect the downpipe from the car. We also at this point do have all the bolts for the heat shield removed. It's going to be a little bit of a fight trying to bring it down, but you will be able to remove it. It's kind of a tight space, but you'll be able to wiggle both of them down at the same time. I found it a little bit easier to remove the downpipe first, and then after that, remove the heat shield from that entire area. So this right here is what I removed from the car. So I've got the downpipe with these two little brackets that actually mounted up to the engine block and supported the downpipe in place. You can see that the downpipe changed color due to the heat. I've got this exhaust wrap that I'm going to be covering the entire pipe in. It's going to be replacing the job of the stock heat shield. So I'm not going to be installing the stock heat shield afterwards because of this titanium wrap. 
With the exhaust manifold now exposed along with my entire turbocharger, you can see that the downpipe is gone and I have no more exhaust. You can also see that my entire intake manifold is removed along with the piping. So up next, we're gonna be removing some of the wiring that's found on top of the motor. So right here, this is a little clip that you need to remove to get access to the leads that are going to each one of the spark plugs and the ignition coils. The entire wiring harness on top of the motor is all one piece. So you can see that there's the wire that goes from one side of the motor, goes around the entire front, goes along the side of it, wraps around behind, and you can see that it's all one giant piece and it even connects up to the piping found on the opposite side of the motor. So all of this needs to be removed and if I were you, if you're going through this procedure, I would take a video of how this entire wiring harness is supposed to go so that when you have to go and put everything back together, you know exactly how it came and you can replicate exactly how it was from before. So we're going to begin by removing a little bit of the wiring harness that's found on top. So this wiring right here goes to each one of the coils and you can see that there's a ground that needs to be disconnected. It's held in place by an 8mm nut. Once you take that out with your ratchet, almost all the wiring up front can be removed. You literally just lift it all up and it should come right out. Moving along the harness, there's a little connector that's attached on the top of the valve cover that you're going to need to slide up. It's going to be a little tricky only because these little connectors are held in place and have a metal internal that need to be pushed out in order to be pulled up. Once you have that out, we have this main part right here that almost all the wires run through. This is literally just held in place by a tab that's pointing upwards. So pull the entire thing upwards and you'll be able to lift all the electrical connectors and the main part of it straight up and over the little hump. After that, there's a cam position sensor that needs to be disconnected and that's also found on the valve cover. Next up, there's a vacuum line that needs to be removed and this found also on top of the valve cover. There's a Torx bolt that you're gonna need to extract using obviously your Torx screwdriver or your Torx ratchet. Once you have that out, you can pull the vacuum line out, but don't forget to put that screw back in there so you know where it came from. Next up, we're gonna remove the coolant temperature sensor that's attached to the thermostat. So the wire goes directly to the thermostat that's found underneath that big loom connector, whatever you want to call it, the big assembly of all the wires. So once you have that lifted up and out, this is pretty much everything from the front and side of the motors. Now these two vacuum lines that you see right here are going to both the wastegate and the blow-off valve. We're going to need to pull both of those off and I'm just using a little pick to help me slide it up and once you have it going a little bit, it's basically home free from there. It's very simple to pull it up once you have it going already. So this right here is the vacuum actuator for the wastegate. And then the other one is the other vacuum actuated blow off valve. After that we can then disconnect the entire vacuum line that goes from the back of the motor and connects up to everything at the turbocharger which is found at the front of the motor. Continuing with the vacuum lines that are actuating the blow off valve and the wastegate, we're going to follow those to the back of the motor, we're going to disconnect any of those wires that are connected to a module, um, we're going to disconnect them electronically. And then from there, we're going to be able to take everything out because these are just going to be in the way for when we take the head off. One of those hoses is going to be connected to a little port that's found on the bottom of whatever the heck this is. I'm not entirely sure what exactly it's going to, but I know that it goes there. So there's a little port and a big one. It goes on the small, shorter one. So I'm not exactly sure what it is right now, but if you guys do know, I'd love to hear what it is. Let me know in the comment section below. Continuing with the wiring harness, we need to remove any kind of plug or whatever that we have attached to it. So if we start and move around to the back side of the motor, you'll see that we have multiple connectors and those are each going to each one of the fuel injectors. So all those fuel injectors are actuated with a signal and that's what this wire is for. So you have the fuel line directly above it and the wiring harness connects to each one of the fuel injectors. So the ECU sends a signal in the wiring harness to turn on each one of the fuel injectors. So there's going to be four wires in total, since my car's a four banger, that we need to remove. Those are all found at the top. We're going to have a couple other wires found on the bottom of the motor, like the knock sensor, the fuel pressure sensor, and a couple other ones. Any kind of thing that's connected, you should be able to easily remove by just pulling up on the tab and sliding the connector out. There's going to be one connector that's going to be slightly difficult and that's actually found underneath the motor. You can't get access to it from up top. So if you jump underneath the car, you'll be able to see that there's a wire that goes and leads to the transmission. There's going to be a little cover that you're going to need to pry off. There's a little tab. You get a little prying tool, slide it out, and you're going to be able to get access to the connector itself. Right now, all you see is the wire. So the connector is found inside the actual transmission. Just like all the other connectors, there's a little tab that you have to push in order for you to release the actual connector from the sensor, slide it up, and then after that you just have to follow the cable along the actual transmission, disconnect each one of the little parts that are connected to it, and then you're going to be able to remove the cable. 
After that, it's pretty much home free. So you're just gonna follow the wiring harness to see if there's anything else that's connected to it. You can see there's one more sensor found on the left rear of the motor. And then after that, the only thing that's hooked up to the wiring harness that we need to remove is the sensor going to the mass airflow sensor that's attached to our intercooler piping. After that, it's pretty much home free from there. You're gonna follow the entire connector, see if there's anything else that's attached to it. And from the looks of it, the only thing that's really held onto it now is the wiring that's leading to the ECU. So the ECU or the ECM is located very close to the engine. So all the connectors and all the parameters have to run through this in order for the engine to run properly. So the engine control unit or the engine control module is going to be found right here. There's a cover that's on top of it to protect the electrical connectors. There's a little screw that you need to remove that's a 10 millimeter. All you gotta do is take that off and the entire cover will be able to come off. There's four additional tabs that are in place on the plastic cover. You just gotta pry those in and you're gonna be able to get the actual cover off. That is gonna expose the electrical harness underneath the cover. During this entire procedure, I'm not looking at any kind of service manual or anything else to really help me out. So I'm pretty much just removing whatever I see fit. So this little connector that you're seeing right here by the bottom of the ECU, I did remove it only because I thought I needed to remove it, but you clearly don't. Um, once you get on top of the ECU, you're gonna see that there's three large connectors and that's where you're gonna see a lot of wires going through. The connector to the far left that you're seeing, along with the middle one, those need to be removed. I didn't know that the rear one does not need to be removed. The other one is only there for the fuses. Now we're not going to be removing those and we don't need to take them out. So we only have to remove the front two clips that have all the wires attached to them. There's one wire that's fishing around the front side of the motor that's going around some oil passages and water passages. If you fish that up and around, once you have those ECU connectors removed, you can remove the entire thing. You can see that once it's removed, it's not really that complicated, but when you have other stuff that's in the way, getting this out is going to be a little bit difficult. Once you have that out, we can finally take the valve cover off. There's going to be a total of 13 10 millimeter bolts that are holding the valve cover onto the cylinder head. There's going to be 11 of them that go around the entire perimeter of the valve cover, and then there's going to be an additional two found on the center of it. With all 13 of them removed, you should be able to lift the valve cover directly up, and you're going to see the internals of the cylinder head. Looking over the cylinder head right now, you can see that we have the exhaust cam along with the valves up front. We have the timing chain along with the timing chain guides found to the left of the motor. And on the back side, we have the intake and the intake valves, springs, retainers, and everything. This doesn't exactly give you a good idea as to what's broken with the motor, so we're gonna continue with the disassembly until we find out exactly what the culprit is. So I just took a look at my camera and I have about 120 gigs worth of footage that I need to go through. So I'm gonna leave this where it is now. I'm gonna leave this and finish this up for part one. So as it stands, we have the motor pretty much ready to be disassembled, but we still have the fluids inside the engine. So we still need to drain all the coolant, drain all the engine oil, and then go on from there. After we do that, we can take the exhaust manifold off along with the turbocharger, remove the thermostat, and then we can further disassemble this motor. If you guys have any questions regarding this video or you wanna see any of the products that I used, check the description box, I'll have links for you there. Otherwise guys, if you have any other questions, let me know in the comment section down below and I'd be more than happy to help. Again guys, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one, peace.